That war that began in heaven more than 6,000 years ago that we hinted over yesterday. Today, let me read it together with you once again. I said I will borrow some, uh, some notches from that which we studied yesterday and bring this together. That war that began in heaven, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, let's read together today. That the Bible records in 12, verse 7, the book of Revelation, open together with me, follow with me uh, through your Bibles kindly. Revelation chapter 12, and I'll consider reading from verse 7. It's recorded, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, verse 8, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Now a war breaks up in heaven between two sides that have polarized against each other. One side is led with Michael, that is Christ Jesus himself. Mike means one who is like God. So that is Jesus himself. And the other side is led sorry, with the dragon. The devil himself, and so when these two sides come up in war, the subject of controversy in the war in heaven was over the law of God. Don't miss that. The subject of controversy in heaven was over the law of God. Ellen White says in Patrick's and Prophet 69, paragraph 1, that that was the subject of controversy, the chief point of focus that brought up a war in heaven. The devil was claiming that God has a law which cannot be kept. He is a dictator, only forcing people into things that cannot be kept. And so that was the main subject of controversy. But the devil lost it in heaven. And verse 12, the Bible records there, Therefore, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, who to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Wrath over what? Why does the devil come down with wrath? Wrath over what? The same wrath that he had in heaven is the same wrath that he extends down on earth. He didn't want the law of God in heaven. He didn't want it also on earth. So when he comes to continue with the great controversy on earth, it is still on the subject of the law of God. Don't lose focus. Our subject is the power of the scarlet thread. And so after the Lord... Throwing him out of heaven, God had a task to prove to the unfallen angels and also to the unfallen worlds that his law is perfect, his law is eternal, his law can be kept. You know, God could not stand in front of those people and say, hey, listen, my law is perfect, it's eternal, it can be kept. That could be dictatorship of him. He had to do something to prove that at least my law can be kept. So what did he do? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. What did God do to prove that his law can be kept? Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fall of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For God to prove that his law is perfect and it can be kept, he created man in his image after his own likeness. That means man resembled God physically. He resembled God in the spiritual aspect. He resembled God in the mental aspect. God did it so, so that when man comes, he can keep his law and prove to the unfallen worlds and prove to the unfallen angels that his law is perfect, it is eternal, and it can be kept. So when the devil saw this, he said, okay, this is your plan. I'm going to thwart it. What am I going to do? Genesis chapter 3. He comes in the garden of Eden through a miraculous serpent who can speak. And he tells the woman, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, he says here, yeah. I'm reading the last part, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden of Eden. He comes to the woman because he wants to destroy the plan of God. He says, it's okay God, I'm seeing you. You want to prove that your law is perfect. It can be kept. It is eternal.
carnal. Now let us see. He comes to Eve and he tells Eve, Hath God really said that you are not supposed to eat of the fruits of the tree of the garden? Now verse 2, the Bible says, The woman Eve said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is the midst of the garden, God has said he shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it lest he die. Hmm. The devil is conversing with Eve, and Eve puts a stress on the words of God by saying, he actually said you are not supposed to touch, nor to eat, lest we die. That was important to the devil. In my preacher's imagination, he plucks the fruit, puts on his hand, and is like, you said, he said you, when you, you touch it, you'll die. I have touched it, I'm not dead. Let me pause there and say in brotherly love, beware of speaking out your mind. Because the devil has no power to read your mind. But when you express it in words, in actions, he fosters temptation. Let me repeat that again. Beware of the words that come out of your mouth and your actions. Because the devil has no power to read your mind. But when you express in actions, in words, he knows it. And he brings temptation. That was the case with Eve. And so at last, the devil tells him, you shall not surely die, verse 4. And then he says, for God knows that in the day that thou eatest thereof, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as him, knowing good and evil. And so Eve says, this is good information. So God is preventing me from being like her, like him rather. And verse 6, the Bible says, one of the most tragic verses of the Bible says, and when the woman saw that the fruit tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and that becomes the beginning of our troubles. How? God had created them to show the unfallen worlds, and unfallen angels, that his law is perfect, it is eternal, and it can be kept. But here we have Adam and Eve who have proven otherwise. And again in my imagination, the devil is, you see, I told you that God's law is imperfect. It can't be kept. He is forcing things on us that are impossible. Look at this. He tried us in heaven. We were angels. We couldn't keep it. He has tried a human being whom he has created in his image in a perfect condition who looks like him, but he has failed in keeping it. It can't be kept. The power of a scarlet thread. So God is, caused, is, is caught in a confusion. Let me use that human term for the lack of a better vocabulary. God is there and he said, okay, is it true that I don't have any other plan again? Remember yesterday we said, the reason why man never died, it's because Christ was the lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. I'll pause there and reason a little bit with you. Yesterday we read a quotation from Bible commentary that says, 1084, page 1084, volume 1. As soon as there was sin, there was a redeemer. Christ was in the garden of Eden as a surety to save man from sin with the same power that he manifested when he died on Calvary. Now I ask, if the same power that Christ possessed, possessed rather, as the lamp slain from the foundation of the world is the same power that he had on Mount Calvary, what is the need of him coming to die on earth again? Why couldn't he stay in heaven? And yet, the same power that he offered himself from the foundation of the world was the same power that he demonstrated on Mount Calvary. Why did he have to come on earth to die for man again? Now, The reason is here. Because the devil still was ridiculing God that his law cannot be kept. It is not internal. It is not perfect. God had to send Jesus not only to redeem us from sin, but to prove that God's law is perfect. God's law is eternal and God's law can be kept. 
hearts. Praise God, brethren. And that is why he sent forth Jesus. But you know, if Jesus could have come as God, huh, that could be unfair to him. Because James chapter 1 verse 13, the Bible says this way. In the book of James chapter 1 verse 13, if Jesus could have come on this earth as God, James says in 1 verse 13, that let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted. Let me hold it there. God cannot be tempted. So if Christ could have come as God, then that could be an unfair game. Say he is God. He can't be tempted. Why do you use somebody who cannot be tempted to show that your law can be kept? So God did something out of order. What did he do? Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 and 5. Galatians, as we proceed with the subject, the power of the scarlet thread. Galatians chapter 4, one of my favorite texts in the scriptures. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. The Bible records there. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. God sent Jesus, man of a woman. He didn't send him as God. He sent him man of a woman. You know, I paused and I was asking myself, why could the Bible write, he sent forth his son man of a man? Why did he say man of a woman? Christ had to meet us at the very foundation of sin, where sin started. Of course, it started with the woman. The Bible says that in First Timothy. It started with the woman. So that is why he's born of a woman. He's born under the law. To redeem us who are also born under the law. So Christ comes as man on earth. So that he can prove that the law of God is perfect. It is eternal and it can be kept. The power of a scarlet thread. And this is recounted again in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Listen to what the servant of the Lord says. The book of Hebrews chapter 2, I'll start reading from verse 9. Then I'll jump to some verses down there. Hebrews chapter 2, I'll read from verse 9. The Bible records the following. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The Bible says that he was made a little lower than the angels to test death for man. Verse 14, the Bible says, For as much as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that the power of death that is the devil the next verse says and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage verse 16 the bible says for listen verily he took not with him the nature of angels the bible says christ when he came on earth did not take the nature of angels, but he took of him of the seed of Abraham. He has come to prove that God's law is perfect, that God's law is eternal, that God's law can be kept by men. So he took the nature of man. Verse 17, the Bible says there, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Christ came on earth as a man. Took the nature of a man. But which nature specifically? Did he take the nature of Adam, the nature of Adam before fall, or his nature after fall? The book of Matthew chapter 1, 16, the Bible says, Matthew chapter 1 from verse 16. The whole chapter talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And when you arrive in verse 16, listen to what Christ or the Bible rather says there. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17. Now listen verse 17 or follow me with your Bible. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. 
from David until the cutting away of uh, Babylon are 14 generations. From the cutting away into Babylon and to Christ are 14 generations. 14 generations, three times. One generation biblically is 100 years. So that means that 1,400 years times three, that is 4,200 years. So Jesus Christ takes the nature of man after 4,200 years of degeneration with sin. Now let's apply common sense a little bit. If you go to the market and you get a second-hand car which has been driven for 10 years, and one which has been driven for three weeks. Which one do you buy? You buy that which has been driven for a short time. Because you know it has not fully depreciated. As that of 10 years. Now Jesus takes the nature of man. 4,200 years after degradation with sin. Don't lose focus of that. He takes the nature after David has been tempted with Bethsaida. He takes the nature after the Bible records in Genesis chapter 6 that it repented God why he had created man. It, it takes the nature of man. After Sodom and Gomorrah is recorded that they were evil, exceedingly wicked. That is the nature that Jesus takes to come and redeem us. He is coming. To prove that God's law is perfect. God's law is eternal. God's law can be kept. That is why Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. The servant of the Lord again is instructed to write the following words. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. Let this man be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Look at that. Jesus took the nature of man after sin. Yeah, I'd rather say after four good millenniums, millennia rather, of degradation with sin, he took that nature. Then he comes on earth to prove that you can live a perfect life down here. God's law can be kept because that was the main point of controversy. Now, why did I entitle my message The Power of a Scarlet Thread? Now, in John chapter 17, Jesus is almost clearing his mission. Then he lifts up his eyes, move with me there, to offer a final prayer for his disciples. In John chapter 17, I read from verse 1, Jesus Christ is offering a final prayer for his disciples. And verse 1 says there, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. Now look at verses 4. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Is Jesus saying the truth? We know he came here to die for our sins on the cross. And he's saying in chapter 17, before he's taken to the cross, that he has finished the work that God gave him to do. Which work is that? Verse says, before that, that he has glorified. He has glorified the Father. And because he has glorified the Father, it is a fact that he has finished the work. Now, a close reading of Exodus 33 verse 18, write that so that I finish in time. And Exodus 34 from verse 5 through 7, Exodus 33 verse 18 and 19, and Exodus 34 from 5 through 7 will clearly show that the glory of God equates to his character. Because in Exodus 33, Moses says to God, show me your glory. In 34, the Lord descends and says, the Lord God merciful, long-suffering, abundant in mercy, he shows him his character. So that means that the glory of God is equal to the character of God. Now, Jesus is saying, I have finished the work on earth because I have glorified you. That means I have exalted your character. And the law of God is the transcript of his character. 
the law of God is the transcript of his character. So what Jesus is saying is that you sent me to show to the world that your law is perfect. It can be kept. It is eternal. I have done that father. Mark you at this time, Jesus has not gone to the cross. But still, he's saying to have finished the work. It's because that which he was sent to come and display, he has displayed. That God's law can be kept. God's law is perfect. God's law is eternal. And when at last he went to the cross, he was only permitted to take our sins on the cross because he had already proven by his life that he has kept the law properly. He has lived an obedient life because Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, Hebrews 4 verse 15, for we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, yet without sin. That is powerful. That Jesus was tempted in all points. That means at one point Jesus was an adolescent. 18, 16, 14, 13 years old. And he was tempted with the peer pressure of adolescence. Never sinned. At one point Jesus was around 20 to 25. Maybe in the confusion of the choice of a career. The choice of a soulmate. The choice of what you want to take in life. But he did not fall. If he lived in our generation. He could have been tempted with the swimming waves of fashions. Swimming waves of secularity and worldism. But he didn't fall during his time. Tempted in all points, yet without sin. Jesus. And remember, he took our nature after 4,200 years of degradation with sin. And he was still perfect. He never sinned at one point. And that is why he went on the cross to save us. Now let me say a point that I've held all this while. You usually say there is, there is power in the blood of the Lamb. Let me tell us, the power in the blood of Jesus Christ does not exist because his blood is green or yellow in color. It does not exist because his blood has got so much red blood cells or white blood cells than ours. It does not exist because he has got much plasma or platelets than us. Mm -mm. The power in the blood of Jesus Christ exists because... He lived a perfect, obedient life to his father's law. And that is why there is power in his blood to save. Praise God, brethren. The power of the scarlet thread. Just the same way that scarlet thread could have been useless on that window. If the law could have not been lifted. And the Israelites step on River Jordan by faith after way is created. Is the same way I say the blood of Christ could be useless. If he had faltered at one point. His blood could possess no power. If Jesus had sinned at a single point. But there is power in the blood of the Lamb. Because he was tempted in all points. Yet without sin. That is why there exists power in the blood of the Lamb. This particular evening I'd like to speak to you and to your hearts. In the words of that song 294. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Would you, O oh evil, a victory win? There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Would you overcome your passion and pride? There is power in the blood of the Lamb. And he says, come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide because there is a power in the blood of the Lamb, brethren. And it exists there only because he lived an obedient life. Life. Did you know that even the angels of, in heaven came to realize the nature of the devil when he took Christ to the cross? They said, okay, it's true God's law can be kept. It's true it is perfect. It's true 
through it's a tunnel. But anyway, he has taken Christ to the cross. They saw his character displayed at Calvary properly. Let me repeat again, brethren. Discover the power that exists in the blood of God. Not because it has a different color. Not because there's a different composition. But because he lived an obedient love, a life. Subject to the law of God. Not because he was forced not because he was cajoled, but because he loved to do that. And power exists there in that blood. Let me conclude this evening by reading from one of my favorite books in inspiration. It's the book, Desire of Ages, page 131. I'll be reading paragraph 2. She says this, Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the redeemer on the throne of God. I repeat that again. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the redeemer before the throne of God. Then she says, she says down there, as the glories of the eternal home past Upon our enraptured senses, we shall know that Christ left all that for us. Let me pause there before I conclude that quotation. She says we will never realize the preciousness of our salvation and the magnitude it possesses until we get to heaven. She says, when we behold the goodness of heaven, we shall know that Christ left all that for us. Let me speak in a human language as John puts it. When we see the streets of gold in heaven, we'll know, okay, he left the streets of gold for the dusty roads of Jericho, at least to meet Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus to save him and me. When we see a golden crown within crown in dazzling stars, we say, okay, this is what he left to put, to put on a crown of thorns to save me. When we see the pearly gates of Jerusalem, we say, this is what he left to save me. When we see the water of the river of life with the tree of life in its side, we say, I, he left this to live a hungry life, a homeless life to save me. Then she says, we know that Christ not only became an exile, from the courts above. Now the next word is fundamental. It says, but for us, took the risk of eternal failure and loss. Christ took the risk of getting lost forever. If Jesus could have sinned at one point on earth, which was possible anyway, he could have been locked out of heaven forever. The same as Lucifer. But because he sacrificed to live an obedient life. There is power in the scarlet thread. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Praise God, brethren. And this evening, you'll do well to go at home knowing that there is power in the blood of the Lamb. Not because of any other thing, but because he lived an obedient life, yeah, an obedient life unto death and go away knowing that even you and me can benefit from the power of that same blood as much as we yield unto his saving power. How many will say together with me this evening, Lord Jesus, help us realize that, help us believe that, Help thou our unbelief that we know power exists in your blood because you live an obedient life. And so help us to yield to that power. That's your prayer and you mean it from the very foundations of your heart. I ask you to rise as we pray together. Thank you. God bless you for responding to that call. And so we bow our heads and we ask God to bless our commitment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us in a very clear manner that there is power in the blood of the Lamb, not because of it, its genetic composition, 
But because of the obedient life that you lived on earth. And so you had the opportunity of taking with you our sins on the cross. And you nailed them. And today we say redeem that we love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the lamb which possesses power. Now help thou our unbelief. Let us walk and live our lives while knowing there is special power in that blood and all who yield to its serving power can also live obedient life down here perfect to your law by your grace. Thank you for hearing us. Bring us again tomorrow to listen from you once again for we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Let's meet again tomorrow and hear from the Lord. Invite more friends. To come and listen with you. Praise God. Praise God again. I thank you all for those who get time to come and hear the word of God. So we'll be uniting again tomorrow as from 6 to 7 in the evening. Invite your friends, invite your neighbors so that you can get the word of God together. Otherwise, the, our routine system, you, you all know, you will channel to Sister Salome. The little you have as we continue with the word in the course of the week. Otherwise, brothers and sisters in the Lord, you are at liberty to live for your residential places. God bless you till tomorrow.